you students and welcome back to another lecture on plants. So today I'm going to be talking about the tension zone. So we began talking about the tension zone on Tuesday. So you learned about it in those videos in my lecture video about the glaciers and how they moved as well as in that short forest video. So today is Thursday, October 23rd and you are going to be completing the following assignment. So we're going to watch the lecture video which I'm going to get into right away on the tension zone. So fill out the guided notes, please, that go along with that. So let's go ahead and show you where those are. The guided notes, once again, each of you have been provided a copy of the guided notes. So not a whole lot of notes today, just uh, two pages. So go ahead and fill those out. And after you have done that, you will take a five question Google form on this topic, the tension zone, and it will be open for you to use um, when this is assigned to you. All right, so you're going to go ahead after this lecture, um, you're going to fill out those guided notes while this lecture is going on, and then complete the Google form. And then there's one more additional thing for Sunday night. So this is Thursday, but it's not due till Sunday night. Um, there is going to be a brief article on the tension zone that I would like you to read. So it's one page. And then after reading it, you'll fill out a quick worksheet. The worksheet is two pages. However, there are very few questions on these pages. So go ahead and learn about the tension zone here. And you'll notice that this table kind of goes a little bit off the page, but that's okay. Just go ahead and fill that in. And I'm not going to make you draw the map of Wisconsin here in number two. You're just going to go ahead and place a star where you think Sheboygan is. So are we in the western part of the state? Are we in the southern, northern, or the eastern? And kind of put it approximately. Try to get it as accurate as possible. See if you can even find Sheboygan County. That would be awesome. All right, so that is going to be the assignment for Sunday night. And before I jump into the lecture, I want to remind you that tomorrow, Friday, October 24th, we will be taking a quiz on the trees unit so far. All right, so we are going to be taking a quiz on Friday. Let me just make sure I got my dates correct. And we will be taking a quiz Actually, it's going to be the 23rd, my mistake. I'll make sure the date is reflecting that. And this is not the trees calendar. So Friday, October 23rd, you'll be taking a trees quiz. And there will be, there will be uh, review resources to follow. A, uh, so I may make a quizlet, but I'm definitely, definitely going to make an outline of some sort uh, that'll list kind of what topics are on there, what note topics, and perhaps even some sample questions. So look for that to follow. But now let's go ahead and jump into the notes. So let me find the proper note slideshow. All right, we are here. So let's go ahead and jump in and learn about the tension zone. All right, so as our review question, our daily question, remember our forests Google form would be due today. Um, so the forest types, that one uh, was assigned on Tuesday, due Wednesday night at midnight. So make sure you turn that in. And if you haven't, go ahead and go back and do that. So I'd like you to identify the five forest types shown in the pictures below. So you can feel free to pause it right here and think about this. And then we would jump forward and we would see that this is the mixed forest. We see a mixture of coniferous trees like these spruces here, as well as more deciduous trees. Um, so for example, these might be maples right here. So mixed, remember that mixed forest occurs right on that kind of boundary of the tension zone. Down here for letter B, we'd have boreal forest, this very northern forest. Um, it's evidenced here. A good clue is that it is winter. Um, so and as well as the Aurora Borealis above. So the Aurora Borealis are the northern lights. Hence the name Boreal Forest means northern forest. So pretty much all conifers. You really would only see conifers here in the Boreal Forest. So that is a clue for that one. Here are some red pines. That would be a clue that you are looking at the coniferous forest, which is not yet um, totally conifers like the Boreal. Um, so you see down here, there are some uh, broad-leafed deciduous trees, perhaps a birch down there. So it wouldn't yet be boreal, but it's coniferous. 
And then D, you know, it just looks like a wet area. So it's probably going to, uh, you're going to think this is going to be a wetland, which would be correct. Um, and these, these conifers that grow in the wetlands are known as tamarack. And they're actually the only conifer, as you read about in that why leaves change color activity, they're the only conifer that changes color and loses their leaves, or I should say their needles. So they would not be considered an evergreen tree. So they don't stay evergreen. They change their color and their needles fall off. And then lastly, in part E, we have our barrens. So our barrens um, essentially is a forest type where essentially the soil type is very sandy and you would see trees like scrub oak and jack pine growing here in these very sandy soils. So very pine heavy in this area. So this almost kind of looks like the lake shore. So kind of this dune um, kind of topography here. Um, so you might be seeing some juniper there perhaps as well, which you would see in Terry Andre State Park. So you might consider um, part of the lake shore, part of that barrens forest type. All right, so today's topic, what we're going to talk about is tension zone trends in tree distribution. We're going to look at how climate changes as we go north and south of our tension zone, and then how our plant and our tree distribution specifically changes in response. So first of all, think about what is the tension zone. So go ahead and think about that for a moment. All right, the tension zone, as we learned about in last time's lecture, is a line established by the glaciers that separates Wisconsin into two distinct climate zones. So in terms of temperature and precipitation, as well as floristic zones and floristic means like plant zones, like what types of flora would, would go there. You've probably heard of flora and fauna. Flora is plant life, fauna is animal life. All right, so tension zone trends. On either side of our tension zone, this darker green, this forest army green colored line, we see differences in climate. Now we have to really define what climate is. So weather and climate in common language are oftentimes used interchangeably. This is not the correct use of these words. So many people are wrong when it comes to the use of these words. They are in fact two very distinct words. So climate is the weather conditions prevail prevailing in an area over a very, very long time. So climate can only be measured on a scale of more than 10 years. If you ever hear about a climate normal, it's like a 30 year uh, data set that they use to compare things to. So climate, very long periods of time. So the climate of Wisconsin, um, essentially, you couldn't evaluate in real time. Like, what's the climate going to be like tomorrow? Um, you wouldn't say that. You would say, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Because the weather describes short-term atmospheric conditions from minutes to months. So I say minutes because weather can happen just like that. And a good example is when a tornado hit um, in northern Wisconsin. I was actually almost in the middle of it. Um, luckily, I was, I was okay. But uh, literally, the thing came through in about one minute. Uh, luckily, I was inside, but I was left picking up the aftermath. So weather can come instantaneously, very quick. Climate changes over a much longer scale, and it's much more predictable than weather. So climate is typically measured in terms of two variables. So the variables are, as you would predict, temperature is the first one, um, essentially how warm or cold the air is. And that's a factor of, you know, how much cloud cover we have and, you know, air masses, wind patterns, all that stuff as well as precipitation. So precipitation doesn't just mean rainfall. It means snowfall, sleet, hail, um, and all sorts of other kind of phenomena, weather phenomena. All right, so let's take a look at how our climate trends look in the north. So if you're wondering where this beautiful photo was taken, I did not take this photo. It was taken at Afterglow Lake in Phelps, Wisconsin in Vilas County, far northern Wisconsin. I've actually gone here many times in my life. It's close to where our cottage is. And it is a beautiful place to ski during the winter. You can actually snow tube down onto this lake. It's a really steep hill. So beautiful. Places like this would have a cool temperature, a cool climate, we would say. So it stayed the same 
for a long time. Cool temperature, frequent precipitation, so moist conditions when we go north of our when we go north of our tension zone. Sorry, couldn't remember the word right there. So long winters with more snow would occur in this area north of our tension zone. This area is what we call the northern mixed forest. The area north of our tension zone is also known as the northern mixed forest. So we talked about like five different forest types and the mixed forest was one of them. And essentially, I don't want to add more forest types to your plate, but really the northern mixed forest and the southern broadleaf that we're going to talk about are really just based on their position relative to our tension zone. So our northern mixed forest is mostly conifers, um, similar to kind of a coniferous forest would have been. Mostly conifers like white pine and red pine, and we're going to talk about those individually. And then there's also some deciduous trees like paper birch and big tooth aspen present as well. But the majority are conifers. The minority would be deciduous trees. So if we look at a couple different uh, different northern mixed forest trees, the eastern white pine comes to mind. Um, all right. So if you've ever seen cones like this, these elongated cones, these are white pine cones. And then here is kind of a drawing, an artist rendition of the needle structure on it. And here is a large white pine tree. They are huge giants of the forest. It's a conifer because it's cone bearing. Greenish gray bark. So greenish gray bark is its color. Needles are in groups of five. So if you were identifying this using a dichotomous key, like on that Y leaves change color, it would be uh, needles in groups of five. They're grouped needles, long cones, and they can grow up to 100 feet tall. So they can be very, very large. And the ones that are near kind of our cottage and I've seen in, in the Eagle River area are at least 100 feet tall. They're huge monsters. The other type of pine species common to the northern mixed forest is going to be actually a non-native pine. So it is called the red or Norway pine. The reason it's called the Norway pine is it was brought over by settlers um, in the approximately 1830s, kind of 1840s when Wisconsin was settled predominantly by Scandinavian immigrants from Norway and Sweden. Um, and I'm, I have Norwegian ancestry, so, but my ancestors don't date quite that far back in Wisconsin. Um, but when I say it was brought over, I don't mean literally they grabbed this tree and hauled it over. The seeds and the cones were, were brought over and used to plant trees. So this conifer, um, is going to have reddish brown or plate-like bark. So that's what makes it different from our white pine. So it's very kind of a scaly bark and it's Pinus resinosa. So if you've ever seen the word resin or resinous, it means it has a lot of sap in it and it burns very well. And I can attest to that. I've burned quite a lot of uh, red pine branches as well. Um, so essentially, it's very resinous wood. Uh, the trees are very straight, very tall, and a lot of times they only have uh, needles on the uppermost branches as the bottom ones get shaded out. Needles are in groups of two instead of groups of five, and the cones are a bit rounder. And these can get really, really tall. They have long been used as ship masts in sailing. So your ship needs a mast to have the sails attached to it, and a red pine um, for Viking settlers and, and Scandinavian sailors um, have long used um, red pine as a ship mast. All right, so we do, however, see some deciduous trees in the northern mixed forest, hence why it's called the mixed forest. There is a mix of conifers and deciduous trees. The paper birch has a lot of kind of historical significance and cultural significance in the north. Um, for example, cross-country skiers um, to waterproof their lower legs when they step in the snow have long actually lashed birch bark around their ankles to keep them dry. So that is where the term kind of birch leggings comes from. And uh, in the ski race I do, it's very popular to, if you're a birch legger, you're a very experienced skier. All right, so deciduous, it is a deciduous tree, the paper birch, peely white bark. So you can 
literally go up to a tree and rip it right off. And I wouldn't recommend it. You know, it's not, or don't just do it anytime. Uh, essentially, if you need to make a fire, it is great for that. Um, I've done that before and you can actually make fires on top of snow using that bark. It's a great starter. Um, now in terms of our leaf shape, uh, to relate back to what we've talked about with our leaf structure, they're oval shaped, simple leaves, jagged margins. So the edge is rather jagged or tooth toothed, you might say, like a tooth-like shark tooth. Um, and it ends in a point. So if you've ever seen any of the uh, poplar family trees, like cottonwood and aspen or, or poplar itself, um, very similar leaf shape to this birch. They can grow only up to about 70 feet tall, and they rarely even reach that, more like 50 feet tall. They tend to rot more quickly and will fall down and the wood tends to rot real quick. That's why you'll see a lot of birch bark like this in northern Wisconsin on the forest floor. All right, southern trends. Now this picture was taken down in southeastern Wisconsin at Prairie Springs, the place where I worked for two years. And this is actually my college advisor, my professor um, for biology, Todd Levin. He's an aquatic ecologist, a uh, great guy. Um, but in this field, this is what is known as a native prairie. So a prairie would be um, essentially a distinct feature that you would mostly only see south of our tension zone, where there would be warmer temperatures, less frequent precipitation or drier conditions. So prairies kind of thrive on dry conditions, shorter winters, less snow in this southern part, southwest, in the southwest of Wisconsin and south of our tension zone. This is called the Southern Broadleaf Forest in general, all the forests south of our tension zone. So broadleaf means essentially the leaves are have a lot of surface area, which would be characteristic of deciduous trees, tree leaves like oaks and uh, ash, for example, hickory, which we'll talk about. Mostly deciduous trees are present in the Southern Broadleaf Forest. There are a few conifers. However, you might see some fir, you might see some spruce or some pine, most of which were planted, not many of which would have actually occurred there naturally. And then you would see more frequent oak savannas and prairies like the one we have down here. And I'll talk about oak savanna going forward. So I'll talk about oak savanna right now. So one of the common trees you would see in the southern broadleaf forest would be the burr oak. The burr oak is a massive tree. And it can actually grow as wide as it is tall. So it's not a tree that's just going to reach up massively tall towards the light and be narrow, but it gets really, really wide. It's really wide. The leaf is right here. So it is kind of a lobed leaf, simple leaf as well. Here's some acorns. So acorns are essentially what, what oak nuts are called, acorns. And then here is another uh, picture. Now, if you notice, um, so it's going to be deciduous. The bark is deeply ridged, what we'd call deeply ridged or fissured. So you could stick probably a, a finger or two across through one of those ridges. So that happens over time to the wood as it grows larger, it kind of crumples, folds over. The leaves are lobed and simple, bare acorns, which are oak nuts. And this is what's going to be the main, uh, the main species found in oak savannas. So like white oak, red oak, um, and black oak would be more so in more of a broadleaf forest. However, an oak savanna is really an open prairie area. It's like a prairie that just has these stands of oak that are spread apart. And you might see these on the edges of farm fields, kind of this oak savanna at an easement between um, two farm fields. Um, so oak savanna, think about it as the oaks are spread very widely apart. That doesn't allow very much kind of low-lying understory vegetation to grow. Um, so it kind of suppresses that. But oak savannas are good and healthy, and we want to keep those in southern Wisconsin uh, rather than having invasive species like buckthorn take over, which unfortunately is happening a little bit. So oak savannas, um, very important and very common south of our tension zone. And they can grow up to 80 feet tall, the burr oak, and 80 feet wide. All right, so that's pretty... The width is really the, 
what's impressive here. So 80 feet tall isn't necessarily huge. I mean, it's, it's big for a deciduous tree. Conifers will get taller, but uh, 80 feet wide is, is huge. The other one I'm going to talk about, so I could talk about literally dozens, but I'm just kind of picking, I'm picking out like two that would be like identifier species. Like if you got dropped out of a plane and parachuted somewhere in Wisconsin and you see a shagbark hickory or you see a bur oak, you pretty much know you're south of our tension zone. And based on the other ones, um, like the white pine and the red pine and the, uh, the paper birch, um, if you got dropped out of a plane and, um, and saw those, you would tell you are north of our tension zone. So our shagbark hickory, deciduous as well. Peely gray bark, so peely in a different way than our, than our uh, um, paper birch. So you can't peel it off in large thin sheets like birch, but you can pull it off in these kind of large bark strips. That's just how it works. I mean, there's nothing unhealthy with the tree. It's perfectly healthy. Um, the shagbark hickory leaf is long, oval-shaped, um, serrated margins. The margin is serrated. Simple leaves as well. The big one I was carrying around in class the other day was the shagbark hickory leaf. And what's really cool about the hickory leaf is its nut. So the hickory nut is a large and nutritious nut. Many um, small mammals like squirrels will subsist or and survive like entirely on this nut during some winters. So it's really great. And the trees actually know how to communicate with each other and know like when is a good year to reproduce in mass amounts. And they would call that year a mast year when they make just large quantities of nuts. And then the animals know this and feast on the nuts at this, this time. And the shagbark hickory can grow up to 80 feet tall. All right, so those are the last of our kind of southern broadleaf examples. Now, I don't want you to say memorize like what what a shagbark hickory tree is, but based on your notes, I want you to maybe be able to identify the shagbark hickory as a part of the southern broadleaf forest. So just kind of know the types of trees that you'd find in the southern broadleaf versus the northern mixed. All right, so hopefully you've been filling out those notes that go along with this that are right here. Fill those out. Those will be useful on a quiz. We're actually going to have a quiz tomorrow on Friday. Um, but before that, I would like you to complete that short Google form on the tension zone. So it is five questions, and it corresponds to this lecture. So we can even take a look at the questions right now. So, and that's right. It is blocked, so I will we'll go ahead and look at that later. So go ahead and complete that Google form. Complete that Google form and then read that article and complete that worksheet. So that is, I realize that's two things, but you've got until Sunday and there will be no additional assignments tomorrow on Friday, just that quiz. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful day.